Hi, I'm Gabriela Fahangi from Kalanish Power Materials, and I'm here today with Michael Naylor, Managing Director of EVM Group in Australia. Hi, Michael. Good morning, Gabriela. Good to see you again to speak to you as well. Excellent. Thank you so much for joining us. So we have big news today. Um, I want to hear all about uh, the projects from EVM. Uh, and we can today unveil firsthand the location of the project. It's the first battery chemicals complex in Saudi Arabia. Please tell us where it will be based and why. The battery chemicals complex will be built in Yambu Industrial City, which is on the Red Sea side of the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. We've been allocated a strategic area of land with a, an area of approximately 1,270,000 square metres, or by our measure, 177, 127 hectares. Uh, the reason why is a very good question. Um, uh, Vision 2030 of the Kingdom, uh, which is sponsored by the Crown Prince, is a perfect fit for the development of this complex. Uh, firstly, uh, the Kingdom is, through Vision 2030, diversifying the economy of the kingdom. Uh, it is a global leader in energy and fossil fuels and the transition to a global leader in energy and renewables is very much a part of the business model and strategy of our company. Um, inside Vision 2030 uh, are the development of industrial clusters, the minerals and metals cluster and the automotive cluster, which is exactly the fit for battery chemicals and technology. Is that it is, is extremely strategic to be located near near future customers. And um, you've recently signed a conditional investment agreement. Uh, um, can you tell us a little bit more about that? Uh, who did you sign it with? And what are the conditions for the agreement and the investment, the estimated investment for the project? Yes, um, as you recall, when you initiated coverage of our company earlier this year, uh, we had signed an, uh, an agreement with the National Industrial Development Centre. They are our lead agency in the kingdom, and they have introduced us to, in this case, the Royal Commission of Jabail and Yanbu, uh, whom we've been negotiating uh, the allocation of land and specifically a strategic uh, location for the battery chemicals complex. So. On the 26th of September, um, our executives in Saudi uh, visited and attended a meeting with the Director General Investment Division of the Royal Commission of Yanbu to sign the agreement. Um, the terms of the agreement, as you noted, are conditional. Um, yes, um, the Kingdom has a process that we must follow. Um, so, for example, the conditions will, will include environmental approvals and permitting. Um, it will require a submission of final plans for the construction of the plant. In this case, we start with the first stage of the chemicals complex, which will be the lithium chemicals plant itself. So those conditions will simply see us delivering documents, plans, drawings, and of course, all the other requirements for permitting and environmental approvals. And do we have a figure for the investment? Yes. Um, the first stage of the battery chemicals complex is the construction of two trains of lithium hydroxide monohydrate. Uh, they will produce 25,000 tonnes of LHM per train per year. Uh, total will be 50,000 tonnes of LHM with both trains fully operational. It's important to note that the Royal Commission um, actually changed the location of land and granted us a larger area. Now that has enabled us to actually plan for the expansion of the battery chemicals complex in stages. And in this case, to add two additional trains, uh, right. each of 25,000 tonnes per annum, giving that complex lithium chemicals plant a total annual production capacity of 100,000 tonnes of LHM per year. That will place that plant in the top three producers outside China. Equally importantly, um, the additional area of land has enabled us to add another train to the nickel chemicals plant. Um, three trains are now planned for that um, battery chemicals complex. Each train will produce over 100,000 tonnes of nickel sulphate per annum, which will be one of the largest nickel chemicals complexes, again, globally, but equally importantly, outside China, 
where we see customers in growth markets, both in the kingdom, which is our first priority of supply chemicals too, but equally importantly to, to Europe and North America, we have uh, original equipment manufacturers looking for independent supply chains. That's fantastic. It, it sounds like, well, it is a world-class project. So we have, um, we will have um, high purity uh, battery materials. We will have lithium and, and we'll have nickel sulfate, uh, cobalt. What else do we, will we have? So the metal suite, and I didn't answer your question earlier completely. The first stage of the lithium chemicals plant involves a capital investment by our company of $800 million US. As we roll out the expansions, um, the nickel chemicals plant and then cathode actor materials plant will see us investing $3 billion in that complex up to 2030. Um, that's our initial investment. Um, and then to go to your question, yes, um, the key raw materials for the production of high purity chemicals for rechargeable lithium ion batteries and renewable energy for us, lithium, nickel, cobalt, manganese. Um, they are the key metals for high energy density cathode active materials. As we proceed with the implementation of the project, initially the lithium hydroxide will be sold to growth markets in Europe and North America, while the nickel chemicals plant is bought online. When the two plants are operating, we will feed the chemicals from, that's the lithium hydroxide monohydrate and the nickel cobalt and manganese sulfate to the cathode active materials plant. What's important there is the two highest value added steps in the supply and value chain for high purity chemicals are the conversion of spodumene concentrate to lithium hydroxide monohydrate, and then combining that with nickel, cobalt and manganese sulfate in a cathode active materials plant, which is where another large margin sits in the value chain. That material is then delivered to the battery cell manufacturing plant and the Kingdom has plans for developing a battery cell manufacturing plant and electric vehicle manufacturing plant at King Abdullah Economic City, which is about 200 kilometres south of Yandu. So it's strategic for that in domestic development uh, through, again, the National Industrial Development Centre and the automotive cluster. Um, when that plant is up, when that those plants are operational, we still have a large output that can be exported to Europe and North America. Fantastic. And where is the feedstock going to come from? A very good question. You'll recall when we discussed this first, the agreement with the National Industrial Development Centre involved building the battery chemicals plants in the kingdom, and at the, at, alongside that was a commitment now companies part to develop the Saudi supply chain. So initially, while we're developing the Saudi supply chain, which I'll speak momentarily about, we will source intermediate product from Western Australia, which is where we are based. Um, Western Australia is the largest producer of spodumene concentrate in the world. Uh, that's the feedstock that we'll require for the lithium chemicals plant. Similarly, um, EV Metals Group already owns a very large deposit of nickel in the Midwest region of Western Australia. And we have our, our studies, engineering studies, working through the development of that plant to produce an intermediate product we call mixed hydroxide precipitate, which contains a nickel, cobalt and manganese that will ship almost in a straight line northwest to Yandu. Um, now, in the meantime, uh, we've made great advances with again, the assistance of National Industrial Development Centre, as well as the Ministry of Industry and Resources. We have 18 application licences in place for exploration um, in the Kingdom. Um, we are first movers in this area. Um, it's, uh, it's been, it's been um, a journey for us, but under the new mining investment law in the Kingdom, we've got 18 applications close to grant. Um, and they cover strategic areas, um, for example, lithium, um, nickel, copper, cobalt in sulphide minerals. I also contain the, the applications also cover areas with, uh, importantly, tantalum, niobium, yttrium, which is a rare earth element. And there'll be a lot 
to be said about our plans for rear earth elements in the kingdom. They are strategic. Um, when we look at global processing capacity for high purity chemicals, uh, China dominates that space. And by building the battery chemicals complex in the kingdom, it opens up the diversification of the global supply chain for key markets in Europe and North America. And rare earth will be a part of that plan. Excellent. I, I was going to go there. Um, obviously, rare earth is a complete um, different game from from um, battery materials. But well, again, can, I, can I help you there? Okay, so the most important thing about rare earth elements is that permanent magnets are critical to the motors, electric motors and the powertrains. China dominates that space. Absolutely. And it's strategic now for Western economies to develop independent supply chains because here's where the Chinese are headed according to our market intelligence. Would you like to buy rare earths? Yes. What do you want them for? permanent magnets for um, drive for, for motors in electric vehicles. And they will say, here is the car. EV metals are going to proceed and try to push with um, rare earth. We have that in our strategy, our plan, uh, the areas that we have applied for in the kingdom, bring rare earths into our business model and strategy. It's not a huge step for us. Remember, Western Australia is also the largest producer of rare earths in the world, but China controls it. And of course, what comes with that is we are going to be importing or exporting to the kingdom uh, technical capabilities, technology and know-how in the exploration for mining and processing and production of high purity chemicals from these critical raw materials. It's a new industry for the kingdom and very much fits the diversification strategy. As background, I would say that our analysis of the data that's been generated from exploration and work in this minerals and metal space, remember, the kingdom hasn't looked for this before. And when it did, it was 20 or 30 years ago and the world has changed. So from our perspective in Western Australia, they're about 20, about 30 to 50 years behind us in these areas. And that's what's been very clever with the strategy that our chairman, Abdullah Busfar, has put in place. He's seen um, through his experience and uh, his, his, his positions with Marden, uh, his last position, I think, was chairman of Marden Aluminium or president of Marden Aluminium. He was outward looking and now has this company in a position to bring to the kingdom world-class technical capabilities to develop these these critical raw materials. Michael, um, looking into your customer markets, so you say Europe and perhaps North America, how can you ensure that your products will be uh, sustainably produced and will have a low carbon footprint? That's a really important question, Gabriella. And of course, uh, we have in our plans, in our studies, looking at reducing and mitigating our carbon footprint that is work in progress. As we proceed with each stage of the battery chemicals complex in the kingdom, we'll be looking at hybrid power sources. So to the extent we need electricity, we'll use it, but at, at looking at renewables as an important contribution to our energy mix. So if you look one step beyond where we're going as a company, we're building um, or making high purity chemicals for rechargeable batteries, both for electric vehicles, but equally importantly for renewable energy. We see a very important part of the development of our company and our business in the kingdom on that basis. And of course, we are building a global battery chemicals and technology business. And the technology is a very important part of our business strategy and model going forward. Excellent, thank you. So just to recap, the complex, um, let's talk about dates. Uh, when do you expect to have uh, your feed study concluded and when do you start, start, expect the startup and um, the ramp up of production? Good. Um, we started feed in July. Uh, we're just waiting for the allocation of the land and the signing of the agreement with the Royal Commission of Jabal and Yanbu 
to pull the trigger. We have not done that. Uh, we build up our feed team, which occupies two floors below where I'm sitting. Um, feed will be fast tracked for completion Q4 2022, ready for us to start construction in the first quarter of 2023. It's a two year, it's an 18 month build. The two trains will be built in parallel. In fact, the first train will head or lead the second train by about six months. So as the construction workforce finishes one part of the plant, it moves across to the other side and builds that module as well. Interestingly, um, the second train is built faster and less, um, less capital because they've had practice on the first. So we'd expect commissioning to commence uh, Q4 24, ramp up 25, that puts trains one and two into production in 26. And the strategic market intelligence reports that we have see the global market for lithium hydroxide monohydrate going into a growing annual structural deficit out to 2030 and beyond. So we're looking at the end of 2030, like there's about 200,000 tonnes of lithium carbonate equivalent uh, lithium hydroxide monohydrate sh short in global supply. And we want to be feeding into that, that global structural deficit come 25 and 26. And that will place the kingdom in a, a very strong position to expand because beyond 2030 out to 24, that, that deficit, that demand gets higher. And then you have the plans to expand and potentially double capacity, is that right? right. Yes. Our plans at the moment are to bring the first train of the nickel chemicals plant online um, to produce. In this case, we've recommitted our engineering studies back to increase the amount of nickel we want to produce. Um, we initially plan to produce 100,000 tonnes of nickel sulphate containing about 22,500 tonnes of nickel. Uh, we have moved to increase that output from the project here in Western Australia to begin with to around 32,000 tonnes of nickel or about 150,000 tonnes of nickel sulphate. The reason for that is such a, there's a huge demand for nickel, for nickel sulphate specifically for high energy density cathode active materials. And we want to be feeding into that shortfall globally in the back half of 25, 20 to 30. Good. So what are the next steps? Next milestones we'll see from EVM. Uh, they're very good questions. We've got a great news flow coming. Um, yes, we've had, we, look, the important thing to say is that we've had extraordinary support across all lead agencies in the kingdom. And um, to be very clear, the kingdom is opening up to foreign direct investment. So our next important step is to bring foreign direct investment through the metals group into the kingdom. Be clear, though, uh, we have got indications of strong support from financial institutions in the kingdom, which is great for everybody. Um, international investors investing in the kingdom will want to see that. Um, so our news flow from here to the end of the year will keep you quite busy. Excellent. I'm looking forward to hearing more about the project. Thank you very much for your time today and to speak soon. Gabrielle, thank you very much for your time and we look forward to carrying on the dialogue as we've got further news flow to announce for you. Excellent. Thanks.